everyone. Um, my name is Frank Place. I'm the director of the Policies, Institutions, and Markets at CGIR Research Program. And I, I'm very happy to welcome you to this webinar slash seminar. Um, we're trying out for the first time a PIM webinar with a live audience. And so I'll explain what that means for our tech, technically for our roles and how we operate in a minute. But first, let me introduce our speaker today. It's uh, Our speaker is Tom Jane. He is a University Foundation Professor of Agricultural, Food, and Resource Economics at Michigan State University and co-director of the Alliance for African Partnership, a university-wide initiative to promote long-term collaborations with African research and policy organizations. Tom is a fellow of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, AAEA, and a distinguished fellow of the African Association of Agricultural Economists. Over the past decade, he's won uh, numerous uh, research awards, including the 2017 AAEA Bruce Garner Memorial Prize for Applied Policy Analysis. Um, I've known Tom for a long time, and I, I, I kind of regret, one of my regrets is that we didn't work together a bit more in the past, but I'm happy to say that we are collaborating now, and I'm very happy that that's happening. And one of the reasons that we are collaborating a bit more is that Tom is part of the PIM program. He uh, is a co, he co-leads our research on economy-wide factors affecting agricultural growth and rural transformation. And his topic today is, in fact, on changing farm structure and rural transformation in Africa. Um, so before I hand it over to Tom, let me just uh, ma make a few remarks. So because this is both a recorded and a, and a live event, um, we have people um, who are listening in, and we ask them to type in questions that they have in the chat window. And we'll we ask as many of those as we can after Tom is done speaking. Um, for those of you in the room, we'll need to use microphones when you ask questions uh, so that people online can hear. And we ask that you hold all your questions till the end so that Tom can get through the presentation and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, so, uh, and Tom will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll, we'll go launch into the Q&A for ho hopefully as long as, uh, as we need to. So uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, see very some familiar faces and some people I don't know, but I'll look forward to getting to know you uh, before the end of the day. So remember about 15 years ago when world food prices shot up, this was in 2006, 2007, and uh, there was all this concern about uh, foreign land grabs, people grabbing land, uh, you know, uh, uh, FAO put out this warning that uh, malnutrition in the in Africa was you know rising dramatically during this time and lots of uh, fear and worry about what was going on. Um, when we look back at what's happened over the past 10 or 15 years, Africa has had the highest rate of agricultural growth of any place any region in the world. Um, if you look at world development indicators from 2000 to 2018. The uh, real uh, inflation-adjusted growth rates uh, for Africa um, was 4.6% per year. The world average was 2.75, so almost, you know, quite a bit higher than normal than, than the uh, world average. Um, and as you can guess, um, we feel that uh, a lot of this growth has been due to dynamic changes happening in farm size distributions and farm structures. So I'm going to try to put the evidence around that for you uh, and see um, what you think of that. Um, a couple of other things that I'd like to relate to. Now this is kind of stuck. Uh, another uh, point that I think is worth bearing out is that Fifteen years ago, our conception of African agriculture was that it was almost totally small scale. Uh, you know, we knew that in Zimbabwe and uh, Kenya there were these large scale uh, entities out there too. But by and large, we thought of African agriculture as very small scale, uh, almost like South Asia. Um, it was dominated by semi-subsistence farms, weak market access conditions, and so forth. But if you fast forward now 15 years to today, um, it is no longer true that the vast majority of African farmland or even African food production 
is under small scale. It has dramatically changed. And I think that the rise in world food prices, having this decade-long period of, of high food prices, had a lot to do with that. Um, I'll, I'll show you that the area under medium-scale farm production has vastly exceeded the amount of land that has been acquired by foreign investors. Uh, so really under the radar screen, African investors have really dwarfed the amount of land that's been acquired by foreign entities uh, in Africa. And in many ways positive and in some ways potentially concerning, uh, there's, this has led to a real transformation in many parts of rural Africa. So the outline that I'm going to uh, lay out here is first just summarize five key findings. Um, and after those five, I'll try to get to the kind of just summarize this and look back and try to take a big picture understanding of where rural Africa is headed uh, with, uh, with agriculture and, and what the policy implications of this work are. Now, I'd like to draw your attention first to where this is coming from. This isn't um, synthesized. This is a synthesis of five or six different pieces. So I'm kind of picking and choosing a little bit. And you can think of this presentation as sort of a summarization of uh, some work over the last five years. This first piece, um, if you're interested in looking at um, how much land has been acquired by African investors, African medium scale investors, comparing that to large uh, foreign investment, uh, you might want to go to the first piece. Um, this is kind of where that gets laid out. Um, the second one in foreign affairs documents just the extent of the rise of medium scale farming in Africa. Uh, the third one, which is in the, in the AJAE, just came out earlier this year, uh, looks at the relationship between farm size and farm productivity um, in a wider range of farm sizes than has traditionally been the case uh, if you use LS, LSMS type of data. Uh, and I'm gonna show you um, a little bit later why uh, LSMS, which is very, very good for understanding what's going, it's population-based survey, so it's very good at understanding what's going on for the majority of small-scale farmers between zero and five hectares. It is not very accurate for understanding what's going on um, on farms that are five, 10, 20, 30, 100 hectares. It gets increasingly unreliable and I think systematically under-reports. Uh, the um, large, larger farm scales. Um, this fourth piece uh, that just came out in the Journal of Agricultural Economics uh, is one that shows the spillover effects of medium scale farms on surrounding small scale farms. So, you know, one of the topics that, um, or the issues that policymakers are very concerned with is that as these medium scale farms grow and develop in the region, are they contributing to the livelihoods of small-scale farmers, or are they marginalizing them? And there's lots of reasons why we might think it could be both at the same time. But some of the positive effects that I think have been um, not very well understood uh, is what that fourth paper is about. Uh, and then this last piece, which is forthcoming later this year in agricultural economics, um, is one that um, just tries to kind of review and put all of this together in a, in a review piece. So our key findings, number one, um, there has been a fairly rapid rise in the number of medium scale farms uh, in some countries. I wanna emphasize this is not happening everywhere. Uh, in densely populated parts of the region, like um, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, we are not seeing uh, a rise in medium scale farms. But where there's land available, where the potential available cropland uh, is, you know, extensive, we, we are seeing this kind of growth. Um, so let's look at Ghana just as an example. We've done this for about five or six different countries, but um, I'm just going to show you this one uh, for an illustration. So this, this, uh, yeah, okay, this. Um, is using GLSS data, which is nationally representative at the, at the district level in Ghana. And uh, we disaggregated from 1992 to 2013 farms according to these uh, farm size structures, zero to two to five and so forth. So 
let's take this um, small scale sector to start with, which is in yellow. You can see that between 1992 and 2013, there has been uh, an 8% percentage growth over that 11 year time frame in the number of farms zero to two hectares. There's been a 72% increase in the number of farms two to five hectares. And the vast majority of farms are still in this, in this range. But the greatest percentage growth in farms is in, in here, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 100, where the growth rates here are you know, phenomenal, um, three or four or five times higher than in the two to five hectare range. So in 1992, uh, Small-scale farming, zero to five, accounted for about 60% of all of the <coughs> farmland under cultivation in Ghana. But by 11 years later, that the the percentage of total cultivated area sh shrunk to about uh, 45%, 60 down to 45. And the share of the cultivated area in medium-scale farmland increased dramatically. So here from five up to 100 hectares, which is how we're defining medium scale farms, five to 100 hectares cultivated land. Uh, that now accounts for slightly over half of all of the area cultivated in Ghana. In Zambia, it's about 55% and, and the trajectory is rising quite rapidly in that country. So um, I predict that maybe in 10 years in Zambia, medium scale farms will account for 60, 70, of all of the total cropland in, in Zambia. Now, mind you, this is not happening everywhere. If you were to do this for Kenya, you would find that the percentage of farms uh, in this area, in this size category, is not rising. Here's Tanzania, another place where there's lots of uh, potential for um, area uh, expansion. When you divide up the categories of farms uh, using national panel data, you see that the only um, category where you're seeing an increase in cultivated land or share of cultivated land is in this medium scale farm size category. Um, and here's one where we looked across <clears throat> several LSMS countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, Rwanda, and you see that um, Okay, so the light, lighter colored bar is the share of marketed output uh, supplied by medium scale farms in the first survey. And then the red one is the share of marketed output supplied by medium scale farms in the second survey. So let's take Ghana here. Um, so over this period of 10 years, the share of um, marketed output by medium scale farms for legumes and oil seeds went from 28% of the national total all the way up to 50 3%, so over half. So over half of the oil seed output in Ghana is supplied by medium scale farms. Uh, grains and tubers, 20% up to 39%. Um, let's go to Nigeria, where it's also increasing, but from a smaller base. So things are more small scale in Nigeria, but in some respects, like horticulture, you know, it's shot up in a five year period. So within five years, uh, the share of horticulture supplied by medium scale farms is now, you know, quite r rising rapidly. Tanzania, similar picture. Um, and then Rwanda, no. R Rwanda is so land constrained with, you know, 95% of the farms under two or three hectares. There just is not any potential for medium scale farming to I mean, land consolidation at the moment. Can't, can't really happen. So that's the trajectory. Um, now, one of the points that I have, we've, we've tried to make, and I, I think it's important to spend time on this, is to show you uh, how grossly underestimated LSMS surveys are when you look at medium scale farms. The only place where we could really test this hypothesis was in Tanzania, because in 2009, there was an LSMS survey that was done in Tanzania. Sample size was about four or 5,000 there, uh, done by the World Bank and the National Bureau of Statistics in Tanzania. But in the same year, they did a census of farm units <coughs> in Tanzania, and they have a 10% sample of that census. So this, um, this sample census survey contains about 55,000 
observations in it. And so, uh, you know, it has a much more um, precision in the estimates at higher scales. So we looked at what these two surveys told us was going on in the agricultural sector. And from farms zero to five hectares, if you compare the two, they have almost identical um, estimates for the total amount of farmland controlled by farm zero to five hectares. And if you look over here, uh, in terms of land under operation, so that's land cultivated and land plus land under pasture land and livestock production and so forth, almost hitting on, on the head. So the LSMS survey, I think, can be considered very, very precise in giving you good estimates about area cultivated patterns going on between zero and five hectares. But when you start to look at bigger scales, like five to 100 hectares, you start to see big um, differences now, where LSMS says there's only there's 3.8 million hectares uh, under farmland, five to 100 hectares. But the Ag Sample Census Survey says there's 5.8 million hectares under cultivation. And that's a pretty big difference now. Uh, the difference is slightly less, uh, only 36% difference for land under operation, as opposed to land on, this is land controlled, but this land under operation. But what this is starting to tell us is that the, um, the, the national level crop production estimates that you get from LSMS may be grossly underestimating the total value of ag output because they're underestimating the 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 number of bigger farms in the sample. Uh, just a point of clarification. Are they underestimating the number of farmers because it's a household survey, or are they underestimating the size that each holder has? Yeah. So I don't think they're underestimating very much the number of farms because these farms in 5 to 100 hectares or over hectares are relatively few in numbers in terms of per percentage of total farms. But they are so my point is that they're underestimating production estimates and and when that goes into national ba food balance sheets and you're trying to figure out what the deficits are uh and so forth you know you can see that there's potential for big errors uh uh if you're if you're trying to rely on those kind of surveys to give you those sort of estimates um, and and you know, more germane to the point of this presentation is that we feel that um, you get a, a, a misrepresentation of what farm size distributions are uh, in these countries by just relying on LSMS. Now, I'm not trying to pick on LSMS. Uh, it's, it's a great survey for understanding what's going on in a populate, rural population based kind of way. But for, for some applications, it's probably not give us very reliable estimates. But nevertheless, we trudge on and uh, using LSMS, we tried to look at over the course of the six year period, what was the contribution of medium scale farms to the growth in Tanzanian agricultural production? So Tanzania is one of those countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa that had almost you know four and a half percent annual growth rates in real terms per year. So it was really clicking forward during this period. And we disaggregated by farm size what the contribution of each of these farm size categories was to the growth in Tanzanian agriculture. So small farms, zero to five hectares, accounted for you know 53% of the total growth in ag output. But farms 20, you know, five to ten hectares, a quarter, and then farms 10 hectares and over 20%. So of the total growth of agricultural output in Tanzania during this period, these medium scale farms accounted for almost half. And, and mind you, that is given an underrepresentation of the importance of these medium scale farms. So we can only guess what the real contribution of medium scale farms has been to uh, you know, Tanzanian agricultural growth if, if we would have had a more accurate representation of the growth in medium scale farms. Now we did the same thing for Zambia. In Zambia, uh, the small scale farms did account for over half of the growth, but 
these uh, medium-sized farms accounted for, again, about 45% of the total growth. Now, the Zambia survey only counts farms 0 to 20 hectares, so it truncates the farm size distribution for us to look at this issue. And even still, farms 10 to 20 hectares accounted for 20% of all of the additional growth in Zambian agriculture during this time. And we, we, we chopped it off at 20. We really don't know uh, what that statistic would look like you know, if we had um, farms over 20 hectares. In Ghana, um, farms between 5 to 10 hectares are really driving agricultural growth in Ghana. It's, it's in this farm size range that over half of the additional value of ag output is coming from, not, not, not down here. Um, so, um, so that's kind of a key finding to us about where the dynamism is uh, in, in African agriculture. Causes. Uh, why are these farm size distributions changing? Well, I've already pointed out um, the rise in world food prices. Uh, this is heightened investor interest in agriculture. Uh, you know, everybody knew about the foreign land grab part of this. Why shouldn't African investors have done the same thing? Uh, there is an urban dimension to this. Uh, many farm lobbies who were very successful in steering benefits towards larger farms. Um, if, you, if you meet with the representatives of farm lobbies in many countries, they live and they work in urban areas. Uh, so there, there's an important um, urban component to these medium-scale farms, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more. Rapid population growth. Now, why would rapid population growth account for changing farm size distributions? Well, it is because of all of the fragmentation and subdivision going on in these densely populated areas, it's contributing to the outmigration of rural youth. And as rural youth move out of the area, the growth rates and the number of farms that are zero to two hectares is very slow as a result. It's much less than the population growth rate. So the medium scale farms are growing rapidly, but in places where land pressures are intense, the growth in the small farms are occurring very slowly. So over time, the farm size distributions shift in favor of medium scale farm and population growth has a big role to play in that. Second uh, key finding that I wanted to mention today is that we're finding that there's, it's difficult to characterize these medium scale farms. They're a very heterogeneous group. Um, some of them are successful small scale farmers who have kind of broken through the shackles of the constraints on small-scale production, They're, they tend to be very productive farmers, and that's what's allowed them to kind of break through and acquire more land and become uh, medium-scale farmers. We didn't find this in the earlier years. We thought these were a relatively small number when we first started looking at this issue five years ago. But in more recent surveys, like in Nigeria, which was just done last year, um, about half of all of the medium scale farms that we found, and this was based on a full listing in two states on, um, of, of medium scale farms, about half of them were just were small scale farmers who had, who had grown. Then you have this uh, relatively wealthy set of rural people. Um, they've been around for a while. So th this is not a new phenomenon, by the way, medium scale farms. There's, there's words for this, like in Malawi, there's a word called achikumba. Uh, achikumba farmers are, are master farmers. They, they have, they have uh, prestige in rural areas. People look up to them for extension advice. The national extension system tends to enlist them into farm, farmer to farmer extension training and so forth. These people have been around for a while, but their numbers have grown. Um, and in some countries, they account for maybe up to 40% of the total. And then you have these urban-based people who uh, were a attracted to the fact that world food prices had risen, and so now the returns to farming are much greater after about 2007, 2008. And so these urban people who had money to invest, instead of putting it into some you know, bank account or whatever, they put it into land. 
and uh, started to farm this land. So a lot of this is going on. And many of the people that we work with or that I work with in Africa are these people, um, the urban-based people who are also land, uh, you know, there's a word for them in Southern Africa, and that's telephone farmers. They, you know, sit in their office and they they give instructions to their farm manager about uh, things and then go out on the weekends to to survey the territory. So the relative shares of these groups uh, varies uh, from country to country. Uh, and if you want to go back to one one of those papers of ours, it kind of goes into more depth and you know provides the statistics for this. So now. The third key finding is that this is all being facilitated uh, by a change in land institutions right now in rural Africa, where land is becoming increasingly commodified. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was, in many places, it was taboo to sell land or to buy land. You could not, it was taboo. You could maybe rent land in some places, but you certainly couldn't sell it, buy it. But those those rules are breaking down, and even the chiefs, you know, even the local power structures in traditional areas, uh, are increasingly treating land as a commodity to be sold to the highest bidder. So willingness to pay criteria is starting to supplant these former land institutions that Frank, I think, you, you know, your piece uh, in 2009 really started to kind of shed light on this. Uh, and it just seems to have uh, increased over time. Um, so land sales markets are now increasingly active. And if you go to the Tanzanian LSMS data set and look at how people acquired their land, you'll see that roughly 30% of all of the land acquisitions for people in that sample, they say they purchased land. They purchased it, and another 35% rented that land. So inheritance as a share of the total has gone way down uh, in many ways. Now, uh, you know, governments are curiously very much in support of these entrepreneurs. You know, their their rhetoric is uh, that we need to put more land in the hands of entrepreneurial, capitalized. Uh, you know, stop thinking of uh, agriculture as a way of life, but start thinking of agriculture as a business. And many uh, government ministers are, this is the rhetoric that you hear coming out of, of these government offices. So they're passing new land laws that are making it possible for people to basically buy land in areas where it was formerly unacceptable to do that. And largely, this is representing a power struggle between the chiefs the, 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 and the state. And, and, the, and the state is most places winning that. And when the state is now capturing land and changing land laws to allow uh, land to be bought in areas that were formerly allocated by the chief, uh, you're seeing sort of these overlapping jurisdictional boundaries between the traditional land institutions and the state. Uh, lots of conflict going on uh, in this area. The fourth finding is that are medium-scale farms a source of dynamism? It's, it's a mixed bag. Um, in some cases, there's evidence that these medium-scale farms are attract. They, they produce big surpluses. So they have attracted large-scale buyers into the area and once those large-scale buyers are in there, uh, they end up improving market access conditions for everybody, including small-scale farmers. So you see this in the data. Uh, and this piece that just came out earlier this year uh, shows this for Zambia. In areas where the medium-scale farms have invested, market access conditions and the prices received for output by small-scale farms has improved. You also see uh, evidence that these medium-scale farms are, are attracting um, providers of tractor rental services to come in. And once they come in, they're also, the small-scale farmers now find it easier to access uh, rental, mechanization rental services, which they're readily adopting, uh, even small-scale farms. Now, why are they doing this? 
Uh, in areas where there's non-farm dynamism, people want to reallocate their labor as much as they can to non-farm activities, but they still want to productively utilize their farmland. So labor-saving forms of land preparation are attractive to small-scale farmers, and the medium-scale farms are facilitating that. This is in a piece but done by um, D. D. Von van der Westhuizen et al. Uh, so medium-scale farms are also attracting uh, service providers, uh, input suppliers, and so forth. So you get the idea. There, there's lots of uh, spillover of benefits that I wasn't aware of, and I, I, you know, we're we're all kind of worried about the rise of medium-scale farms' effect on marginalizing small-scale farms, and that seems to also be happening in some cases. Uh, so it's not an unmitigated positive story here, but there are these kind of rural transformation dimensions here on this slide that are showing that um, there are some positive effects. Now. Uh, in this AJE article that just came out, we looked at the um, productivity differences between small and medium scale farms, and there really is an advantage to the bigger farms because mechanization really lowers the cost of land preparation. Uh, many of these small scale farms that are labor intensive, uh, um, they, they just can't compete with the productivity advantages of mechanization when you get to 10 50, or 50 hectares. We also found that the medium scale farms are using fertilizer and uh, herbicides and other labor saving technologies more efficiently uh, and more intensively, I should say, than, than the small scale farmers. So it's a combination of mechanization and other input use, which is giving the advantage to the more capital intensive forms of agriculture. Now, now, in places where you know development is occurring in Africa and wages are in, real wages are rising. Real wages have like tripled in some countries over the past 15 years. So as wage rates continue to rise, labor-intensive forms of agricultural production are going to become increasingly um, un unproductive and uh, less competitive, I guess, compared to more capital-intensive forms of agriculture. So it seems like the way of the future, it, in areas where there's going to be continued wage growth, in the region, finding labor-saving forms of agricultural technology probably going to carry the day. Land prices are also rising rapidly in many parts. Um, so here in Tanzania, you see that there is a 55% uh, increase in real terms, so these inflation-adjusted terms, uh, in the, the median and the mean of uh, land prices just over six years. Uh, so, so in in place, and this is especially the case in places with good market access condition. Close. So, if I disaggregated this by distance to an urban area, you'd find that there isn't that much increase in land prices in the remote areas, but there is a major increase in land prices in favorable areas in Tanzania. So, so the the, the places where these medium scale farms are going to come in. Are not necessarily ones that are you know right next to urban areas. They're they're going to be out there a little farther where land prices are not that high. Okay, so let's uh, kind of keep, uh, wrap this up. I've got two or three slides about implications. Um, the first implication is that, and, and I, you know, I think that we've sometimes been misunderstood about this. Like we're advocates of medium scale farms, and we're, I'm, I'm, we're not. Uh, we're, we're trying to just indicate what's happening. Uh, and um, these are the kind of things that are happening in the in rural Africa right now. And um, just so that there's n n no mistake about it, um, we are not saying that we should drop our support to small-scale production or small-scale farmers. Um, they certainly are the vast majority of rural people right now. So they absolutely need to be the cornerstone of an agricultural development strategy for rural areas. Uh, so in no way does do these results you know, invalidate that. But you can start to think of medium scale farms as a conduit for improving market access conditions, helping support labor saving kinds of technology for some small scale, small scale farms, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, think of them as a tool uh, to uh, help develop the rural countryside um, but this will have to be done carefully, of course, 
Uh, and it can't be done in places that are densely populated, where there's no potential for land expansion. It has to be in areas where there's really potential uh, for land expansion. So, so maintaining the focus on productivity of small-scale farmers, certainly uh, you know, no, no, diff, no, no, no quibbles there. Um, and then sustainable intensification strategies will be highly location-specific. So certainly we have to disaggregate rural Africa by the level of population density and by the level of economic dynamism. You know, what's going on outside of Dar es Salaam right now where there's massive growth happening? Uh, the, the potential for medium-scale farms and rural dynamism is going to be very different uh, outside of Dar es Salaam than it is going to be, let's say, in northern Malawi. Those are two fundamentally different places. Same thing about remote areas of northern Ghana versus southern Ghana, where there's a lot more um, economic dynamism and pulling rural youth off the farm. Okay. The implications for land policies now, ministries of land. Uh, in low population density areas, we feel that allocating um, land to larger farms or facilitating a large farm access to uh, land will have very few uh, downside effects. Uh, but doing it in densely populated areas could have massive dislocation effects. So we, we need to distinguish here and make sure that we're protecting land tenure security of local rural people. Now, I put local in quotes here for a reason. I'll tell you in just a second. Uh, but supporting land markets to allow local rural people to be compensated for selling their land and not just losing it, uh, which is... Now, what's, what does local mean? Um, many people who are urban-based people uh, will go back to a headman or a chief in their area where they were, might have been where they were born or where their family, and they say, I'm local. I deserve, you know, my 20 hectares. And they'll put pressure on the customary authorities to allocate land. Uh, and so we, we need to come to grips with what local means because some of these local urban-based people are definitely displacing um, others from, from land. And that's, you know, a big cause for concern to be incorporated in the land policy. So coming to grips with what local means, I think, is an important thing. And then lastly, uh, now implications for um, ministries of finance, which generally are the ones that have the national statistical agencies embedded within them. Um, the, the idea here is that let's not be too sanguine uh, about um, you know, our, our database for large-scale farms. The, um, there are many African governments who have no idea what's being produced and how much uh, so a lot of planning uh, for importation, for food balance sheets, and so forth, they're really in the dark because there's not any accurate estimates of what's happening in medium and large-scale farms. So uh, getting more attention uh, to periodic farm senses uh, will probably be a good idea. Um, so that's, uh, let me give acknowledgments here. Um, there's five different groups that have uh, contributed to this work uh, over the last five years, including uh, Tim. Uh, so uh, under Flagship 2, uh, this is one of our many areas of work. So, Frank, thank you so much. Yeah, you. I look forward to questions. Thank yeah, thank you. So I will, um, you know, see if there's some questions from the room first. Uh, take about, can we take three and then sure. you can write down? We got a pen. Yeah. And then we'll go, and it, sorry, we'll take uh, some in the room and then go on online and see what's there. Hmm, this is blinking and flashing at me. So uh, over to you, Harold. Uh, I'm curious. One of the uh, major reasons for difference in gender productivity has been access to uh, traction power. Um, now, as you're saying, going over to higher service could be a plus or could be a minus because it's not clear who gets access to the higher service, uh, particularly because that does usually take uh, access to loans too. Do you have any ev evidence on that particular question? Not yet, Harold. Um, but I agree with you that it would be important to for us to do that. 
Um, so you're, you're saying the, the research that you're invoking here is saying that women are having difficulty renting mechanization services. No, because it's been in the past access to to to, to uh, uh, bullocks, and now if you're going over to higher service, you may actually I'll be improving. The, it could be, yeah. but th okay. it depends on that that access. Great. Okay, I like that line of inquiry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks, Tom. Very interesting. Three quick questions. One on the source of the land. Can you? It, I wasn't quite clear whether it's coming mostly from land that's currently uncultivated and vacant, or being acquired from existing farms. Yeah. Secondly, the management of the farms. You made a reference with your telephone farmers mm -hmm. to farm managers. Is that typical, or are there some rural resident uh, self-managed farms? Are there rental yeah. arrangements and so forth? And okay. then thirdly, do you see a difference in? in what's produced on the medium size versus the smaller farms. Okay. All right, good. Can I go away? Okay, why don't you, since he asked three of them. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, very clever. Yeah. And then we'll come back. Okay. Uh, so, so Keith, uh, on, on, on land, where, where's that land coming from? Uh, again, it will depend on which country. So in the work that we did on this in Malawi, we found that there were, small-scale farmers were often being displaced. Uh, so the area in and around Blantyre and uh, Lilongwe used to be, 20, 20 years ago, mostly under small-scale production, and it's not anymore. It's been, those small-scale farmers have been basically cleared out, uh, and the areas around Blantyre and Lilongwe are now investor farmers. So displacement has definitely occurred in Malawi. In Ghana, uh, no. Um, most of the expansion of medium scale farms has been in the Brangahafo and northern and upper north, and there was a lot of land available there and a lot of unutilized land remaining uh, there. So, so very little displacement going on in Ghana. So it just does vary from one place to the other. And the thing that seems to have the greatest explanatory power there is population density. Okay, now your second question was management. Yeah, um, so the farm managers is becoming a huge constraint to the expansion of medium these investor farmers because they need managers, and they're they always say that's the hardest thing to do is find managers that they can trust. Uh, so. Um, that's a huge constraint, and I actually think that this is. Um, when you think about the capacity development needs of Africa to power forward uh, transformation of rural Africa, uh, that the region really has an unmet demand for good management, farm, farm managers, and you know, Tibet kind of training and so forth. There's, I think, there should be a huge demand for that. Third one was, what do they produce? <laughs> yeah, there's not very much difference in production patterns. Uh, it really, production patterns in a given area are going to be similar uh, on small and medium scale farms. They'll vary a lot across regions, but within regions, there's not that much different difference. And then, uh, did you want to follow up with Harold's? Uh, Any more about Harold's question? No, it's just a good. You know, it's a good. Uh, we'll we'll definitely look into that. Okay, we have three and Will. Anyone else in the room? Yeah, this one is regarding the displacement. Uh, are the surveys already showing um, any great displacement and increasing in landlessness? Yes. And on the other hand, uh, are there any gender implications of these kinds of transformations that you're picking up or you're planning to look at? Yeah. Yeah. So in in, um, in this paper, or in one of the papers, uh, will this be distributed to the uh, public? Yeah, yeah. So in 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 the last paper on that reference list. There's uh, evidence on on that uh, that question that you so the gender implication by gender of these transformations. Yeah, and I, we we have yet to examine that, um, but it's it, it definitely is a huge a huge concern. It seems to be a male-dominated capital-intensive trend going very on. much. Well, yeah. 95% of these medium scale farms are men. 
Thanks very much. Wonderful presentation, as always. Uh, lots of new stuff, I mean, uh, over the last few years. Too. But a big question, you know, 30 years ago, there were a lot of land-abundant countries in Africa. Um, if you think, if you look at the UN population projections and move forward 30 years, you know, which is a relatively short time, um, <clears throat> countries like Nigeria and Ghana, I haven't sort of done the calculations, you know, to the potential arable land, but uh, they don't, it seems unlikely to me intuitively that they're going to be land under at all. Um, and how does this, how do these two sort of tectonic plates? Uh, <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Um, so I agree with you that um, that that a potentially available cropland, as it's kind of defined in the ge geography literature, mm -hmm. is going to go way down as population, rural population growth, you know, marches forward. Um, so how these tectonics are going to, you know, land markets are rising. And as land becomes increasingly commodified, I believe that that this trend of consolidation, if that's what you want to call it, uh, but changing farm size distributions is probably more technically accurate, that it's going to in just further increase in favor of medium and large farms because those people are going to start acquiring land through markets. Uh, and and that's going to be the mechanism. And even though it's going to cost them now to do it, whether right compared to now, where they're basically getting it for free, uh, it's going to cost them now to expand. But that that, that should um, confine uh, the medium scale farmers to be more productive. You know, uh, so I think it's going to continue, um, but it's going to be through land markets where the seller where the owners are now compensated. Whereas right now it's just a it's a taking. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So uh in some Asia country uh, we found that as the medium sized farm emerge they tend to hire local people to work in the farm. So have you observed any change in the local employment or labor market? Yes, uh, we have. And I, I, I will confess, and I, I welcome your, your input on this. Uh, uh, they do employ, uh, so per farm, they employ many more people than small-scale farms. But per hectare, small-scale farms employ more people. Um, so they're more labor intensive, and they hire more people per hectare. So I just don't know what the labor market implications are, are for these medium scale farms. Um, but I, I do feel that um, perhaps the more important effect on labor markets is going to be um, general equilibrium effects on rural non-farm. Because these medium scale farms have a lot of purchasing power and they tend to, they tend to buy more. And, you know, and so the expenditure patterns will have employment effects uh, that may swamp the direct um, labor hiring effect on the farms. And it's just very complicated, and we haven't really gotten very far on this. I wish it's a ripe dissertation topic. Yeah, I think. Uh -huh. So let's throw a few questions from online in the mix. Uh, one was about India. If you think that the medium scale farms are also possible in India. Uh, it's right. beyond my <laughs> geographic <laughs> scope. Uh, Let's go back to Africa then. Uh, but I, you know, <laughs> but it's uh, you know it's a good question, and I wish that yeah. there were more work that was being done on this yeah. uh, in other parts of the you know that we should be doing this in Asia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the next question from Africa, um, and starting with sort of a comment, it's good that we are passing in Africa from small to medium farms. This implies that more water will be used for irrigation. What water solutions are being used in a sustainable way? And are you planning to apply a solution to, I think, solve the, the desalination for these farms? Okay. The authors. Uh, That's another topic. great dissertation topic. Um, <laughs> you know, these are, you know, I knew this would happen, that um, they were, they're, you're raising really good questions that we have not looked at. Uh, in the four, four or five years that we have looked at this issue, 
um, there's just many emerging questions, and that's well, that's a good one. Um, you know, is there going to be more uh, irrigation now or in, from medium scale farms and so forth? Um, so I agree with the importance of the question, but I don't have any any insight. Um, in terms of the data sets that you have, are you able to look at those kinds of investments, water and soil conservation investments, or are the data pretty poor in them? Ask whether uh, there's irrigation and whether the assets owned include irrigation equipment. So in a rude, cru crude way, I think we could could look at that. Yeah, but I think doing it right would involve other kinds of bringing in other kinds of spatial data. I wanted to just one question for me. I wanted to kind of follow up on Keith's last question about what do they produce versus the medium scale versus small scale production practices. And it, and it is kind of curious, actually, that they are similar because if you think about the fact that at least in some of the countries where the medium scale farms are occurring are in certain areas of the country, not everywhere, yeah. you know, so they're like in the middle of Ghana versus southern Ghana, which is quite different. And then the other thing is I, I, I think I remember some previous uh, presentations uh, or, or papers about, the, the, you know, it's much more likely to sell most of their produce from the medium scale farmers than smallholders do, yeah. which also might tend to steer them in different directions yeah. in production practices. So I was wondering if you had any more thoughts about why they're yeah. not so, more different. <laughs> yeah, th okay, thanks for um, helping me clarify this. So I didn't say that, you know, if you look at it nationally, okay. you can find some differences. Yeah. But if you uh, hold the geography yeah. constant uh, for, for any given geographic zone, the production patterns seem to be similar. But as you just pointed out, that uh, medium scale farms are concentrated in some kind of geographic zone. So if you do compare just in a bivariate way, yeah, you will see some differences. Uh, and um, medium scale farms tend to invest in places where row crops are, 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 are viable. So, you know, mechanization requires you know, row crops. So you're not going to get um, a lot of, you know, hand-picked tomato production happening in you know, it, on medium scale farms, it's it's kind of the the main row crops. But um, in areas where they are, that tends to be the same kind of production patterns that small scale farmers also do. Um, it, it, not under row crop, but maize, bean inner crops, and so forth. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the room or online? Keith, Keith has a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots more, but I'll just ask one more, which is, um, are these largely individual investors? Do you see the emergence of a, a corporate yeah. farming sector, either on the management side or the ownership side? Right. Good questions, Keith. I, I, um, well, the LSMS data sets are all family farms, so, so all we have to work with or what's going on on, you know, all, all this stuff that I presented is family household farms. But um, certainly there are some corporate co cooperative farms that are going on that we just don't have data on. You know, there, there's, there's, a lo there's a lot of missing information uh, in this area. Uh, so once, once again, I think you're, you're making the case for why there should be a farm census uh, periodically in some of these countries. Good. Well, let me ask. Uh, maybe end with one final question. Okay. So you, you've mentioned a lot, lot of uh, you synthesized work from the past and tantalizes tantalizes with a few current things that are coming out. But what's what about in the future now? Do you have wh what are some of the big gaps that you still see that okay. you're, you're, yeah, you and your team okay. are going to try to tackle? Uh, great. Good. Okay. So um, one of you asked this question. I can't remember which one, but um, the expenditure patterns. Um, you know, one of the th I have a feeling that the uh, the general equilibrium effects resulting from multipliers and all of that are really where the action is. So if people are going to benefit from these bigger farms or not, it may be a lot related to what the, the strength of the multiplier effects that they have for non-farm. And we just don't know yet. Um, there's one or two people I'm aware of who are starting to look at this issue, uh, and you know we may also start to look at this issue. Uh, so um, the jury's out right now, but I think that that's going to be a really important finding to know whether small. You know, remember back in the old days, John Mellor 
and Bruce Johnston were saying it was small-scale farms that generated the biggest multiplier effects in the rural areas. And these larger Latifundia farms in Latin America, they didn't give you much because they were all spending their money on, you know, in urban areas and on imported luxury goods. That may be what we find, but I don't believe it will be what we find because, because we, we're finding many of these medium-scale farms are former small-scale farmers who have grown. Those people are dynamic, productive farmers, and they're probably going to be well-connected to, um, you know, economically to the communities that they're a part of. Uh, that's different from the way latifundia agriculture was in Latin America. So, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if the multiplier effects from these groups are, are very strong and that they contribute to rural non-farm growth. Another research issue that I think will be um, important to, um, uh, to look into is um, uh, land, just land tenure. Uh, there, there are so many people right now that are landless. Yeah, you, you raised this about landless. Um, yes, there's a piece that came out a couple of years ago by um, uh, Muller and Chan. Muller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R and Chan. If you Google it, uh, it, it points, it, it also cr critiques the LSMS data sets, um, saying that uh, they really underestimate the extent of rural landlessness. I think that was you who made that point, right? Um, uh, so according to them, uh, surveys that ask properly about, um, you know, engagement and non-farm and all of that uh, informal wage, uh, informal peace wage, uh, there's, there's a lot more of that going on than one would get the impression from LSMS. Um, I found that to be a you know controversial but intriguing uh, piece. Uh, if you wanted to look at that, Muller and Chan. Um, so, uh, so I think coming to grips with uh, land tenure displacement, and then multi-year lease markets as the way off the horns of this dilemma. Um, rather than selling being the only option, if landlords could um, lease out their land under multi-year arrangements then that might make it possible for them to be willing to do that without the fear of, of losing their land. And then people who are, uh, feel like they could invest for five years and recoup the, um, the investments that they put in the land over a five-year period, that could become you know, more viable. So, so something about that would be, I think, useful too. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks again, Tom. So just for all of you in the room and online, that we will post this uh, webinar on the PIM website uh, shortly. So if you want to look at it again or share it with uh, uh, your friends and colleagues, please do. So once again, let me uh, thank Tom very much for his presentation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, too, for, for all your questions and your comments.